stories are the most powerful thing on earth. They are literally life and death. Wars are waged based on the story of who is the hero and who is the villain. You are the result of a story your parents told each other. The one night stand, the soulmate, and friends who became so much more. Life and death. So wouldn't you like to understand them better, these stories? How Story Works, an elegant guide to the crafts of storytelling by Lonnie Diane Rich, demystifies stories and helps you understand why you love what you love, why you hate what you hate, and why prologues are almost always a bad idea. How Story Works by Lonnie Diane Rich. Available on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback form. Get your copy today. Welcome to Still Pretty, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm film scholar and pushy queen of slut town, Noelle LaCroix. And I'm story expert and de Lonnie Diane Rich. And we are here today to talk about him, the sixth episode of season seven. Him aired on November 5th, 2002, it was written by Drew Z. Greenberg, a man, and directed by Michael Gershman, another man. <laughs> Still Pretty is a fully spoiled, full-spectrum Buffy podcast, so if you haven't seen all of the show, go take care of that and we'll be older and hotter and have sex that's rough and kill people. That jacket was with me all the way through high school. Gave it to him when I graduated right before I started over the pizza barn. I'm in the management program. Let's go on patrol! <laughs> In him, Buffy deposits Spike at Xander's, hoping that getting him out of the school basement will make him a little less prone to talk to people who, from her perspective, are not there. Xander complains, but allows it, giving Spike the closet for his bedroom. On the bleachers at school, Dawn asks Buffy about Spike, and Buffy isn't really sure what to say, aside from basically, it's complicated. Dawn asks the soul question. But to get a soul? Like, that would make him a better man? Xander had a soul when he stood Anya up at the altar. As Buffy takes off, Dawn wonders why anyone even bothers with love when they could be so much more productive painting murals. And then she sees a boy on the football field put on his letter jacket and... At Anya's apartment, Buffy rescues Anya from an assassin demon sent by de Hoffren and suggests that maybe Anya should stay with them for a while where they can keep her safe. Anya reluctantly agrees. At school, Don bumps into the letter jacket boy, named RJ, and tries to be cool with his friends, but they make fun of her. As they walk away, she realizes what she must do. Get on the cheerleading team where RJ will notice her. She borrows Buffy's old cheerleading outfit and goes out there with no practice and no experience. She predictably embarrasses herself, then comes home crying where Buffy consoles her Kind of. From what you said, I I'm sure he already noticed you. I mean, look, the falling and the... Spirit! Spirit! He, they said you were spirited, right? Buffy tries to talk Dawn down from her wicked crush on this boy, but Dawn won't budge. At school, when RJ's friend gets the starter position for the weekend game, Dawn pushes him down the stairs, breaking his leg. She meets with Buffy and Principal Wood, says she never pushed the kid, he fell, and that's that. Both Buffy and Principal Wood believe Dawn and let her go. Out in the hallway, she bumps into RJ, who is very impressed with her cutthroat approach to love. That night at the bronze, Buffy, Willow, and Xander cite RJ with a girl on the dance floor, and they heartily slut shame her until the girl turns around and it's Dawn. Buffy grabs her and drags her to the side, but when Dawn won't budge about RJ, Buffy takes her outside where another cheerleader confronts Dawn. I'll never let you have him, bitch! RJ is mine, I mean it! Stay away from him! The next day at school, Buffy sees RJ coming out of Principal Wood's office and takes him aside for a chat. Then while she's taking him down a peg, he puts on his jacket and then... Later that night, Buffy tries to talk Dawn into being less assertive with RJ. And okay, Noelle, look, I'm so sorry. I need to stop. I mean, I thought Go Fish was the worst episode of Buffy, the one that I hated the most, but this one is so much worse. And even just talking about it makes me so tired and I just can't. So, well, okay. I mean, it's a fully spoiled Buffy podcast. Everyone here has seen the show. You want to just 
skip ahead and get this over with? Yes, please. All right, so uh, Noelle, yes, um, yeah. Here we are with this episode of Buffy. That um, when when I did this for Still Pretty and the early parts of this, where I was doing it on YouTube, I opened it with a big rant about all the reasons why I hate this episode, and so I started going at this episode again like another episode that we talk about like every other episode that we talk about and I just hit a wall (laughs) where I cannot Noelle I cannot talk about this episode (laughs) I mean here's okay here's the thing so (laughs) like I'm watching this episode and I Mm -hmm. I think I get it now Lonnie because like okay listen I'm not straight, but I am narrow. And this episode was such a powerful insight into heterosexual culture and the heterosexual cis female experience. I mean, I just never realized how difficult it is to be straight and cis. Like the women Mm -hmm. in this episode face so much oppression just because of who they love. And my heart just goes out to them. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, have I just missed it all along? Is this your experience as a cis het? white woman like it's As so sad cishet, yes <laughs> i would like to speak for every cishet white woman and say yes absolutely this is my experience and i'm so and i really appreciate you seeing me right <laughs> through that i mean <laughs> oh. i hope you understand that that your ability to see that makes you such a better Gay woman. I mean, I'm like, like I'm an ally, really, to like you are the heterosexual ally. community, the underrepresented. Oh my god! See, I can't even. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're we're reversing roles here. We didn't mean any of that. I just want I everybody can't to be clear. even with this. Okay, but all right, yeah. all right. But like, mm-hmm. all facetiousness aside, <laughs> yeah. If this had been written by women in a like, oh, isn't it kind of stupid that? we lose our minds just because a guy is the captain of the football team. Like, ha Mm -hmm. ha. Like when we're laughing at ourselves for the ridiculous things that we do. Yeah. I'm kind of fine with it, but Mm -hmm. this whole episode just feels like lol bitches be crazy. And that's the (laughs) joke. Like, I don't, (laughs) you know, I mean, and we stop an entire season of television to do this. Yes. Like what? Yes. There is no plot. No plot happens. We get Spike out of the basement and into Xander's mm-hmm. closet, which now that I say it out loud sounds like interestingly homoerotic. But <laughs> that is the most interesting thing about this episode is like the, the unintentional yeah. homoeroticism of Spike moving into Xander's closet. That's it. Yes. Exactly. I mean, exactly. I, uh, it's just it's it's a terrible episode. And I've always said Go Fish is the worst episode of Buffy. But I don't think so anymore. Because I can watch Go Fish. I can talk about Go Fish. Like I've done the Go Fish. I've run the Go Fish gauntlet a couple of times. <laughs> I have run the him gauntlet exactly once. And now here I am at my second thing and I'm just like, oh my God. And the thing that makes me crazy about it, the thing that drives me the most crazy about it is that the episode has some surface level charm and the jokes while terrible, while horrible, while absolutely like patriarchy affirming, which we're going to get to, they're well constructed. And it drives me crazy because the presumption upon which all of those well constructed jokes are built that brainwashing women into doing everything for this boy is cute, is just too rape culture for me. And it makes me fucking tired and i'm so tired noel i am so tired of talking about this stuff about how boys will be boys and isn't it cute and the idea of having sex with someone because you've brainwashed them as not rape like that it just it makes me crazy but here's one of the things though that i have to say that as much as i hate this episode Working with you on this episode <laughs> fucking delights me because I want you to tell everybody what you named your first section in our notes. <laughs> okay. So we have these section headers in our notes, which maybe we've mentioned before, maybe not. And usually they're just, here's this thing I want to talk about. But right. when I was looking at something to talk about for this episode, mm-hmm. I was like, well, there's a so, so the whole, the whole 
I was going to say it's the MacGuffin, but it's not, or the MacGyver, or the Red Herring, or the <laughs> McDuff, or the whatever yeah. it is. It's, it's, it, I said, it's MacGuffin, right? I said it. and then It's I, MacGuffin. Okay. I said oh, it. I'm sorry. I thought you were making fun of it. No, I no, was making you? fun of, I was making fun of myself <laughs> for like saying the thing and then immediately having that thought process where you're like, I just said the wrong word and I said it on a recording and now I have to go with it. And see, no, now we're- you were right. This is great. You are so much smarter than you give yourself credit for. <laughs> you know what? I just turn off the filter every now and then and just like let it go. I but, love it when your filter is off. <laughs> so, <laughs> hello. Um, hello. But- yeah, so so this this section of our notes I have entitled I have titled Full Meta Jacket. <laughs> when I saw that in the notes, I fell in love with you just a little bit more. I love it. I love it. Because all right. I mean, mm-hmm. previously on A Man Wrote This, right. We discussed the trio and how part of what makes them evil is that they're cheating at masculinity, right? Mm -hmm. This unearned power and gross misuse of power are real things in the world. They are real things Mm -hmm. in the real world that really hurt lots and lots of people. And the trio do a lot of damage. But what gets them there is the pursuit of the hegemonic masculine ideal. Mm Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot of bad in this episode, Lonnie. There's so much bad. I mean, there's a whole lot of bad in this episode in part because we've already done this. We've already done the, like, love spell makes women crazy. Um, Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and as I was picking it apart and trying to queer it and trying to find some accidentally radical idea in it, it occurred Mm -hmm. to me that the sinister element here isn't that the magic jacket is altering women's desire. It's mm-hmm. that RJ and men like him are cheating at masculinity. They're cutting the line, yeah. right? And that's what we're offended about in this episode. <laughs> well, and that's what makes it like, that's what, the, uh-huh. it's this big revelation, right? That RJ was into quote unquote nerd stuff before high school. Mm-hmm. And he only quote unquote blossomed with the aid of the magic jacket. Yeah. The implication is that popular athletic guys are, are getting girls not because they're good dudes who are actually desirable, but because they're cheating at hotness with their magic jackets. And that if women weren't under the magic jacket spell all the time, they'd see the nice guys who are right in front of them, who are not handsome or athletic or run a lot, but are nice guys and therefore much deserving of the sex. Oh, Like, it's so subtextual. It's so subtextual. But... You know, something that that you go off on and you will go off on again in about, (laughs) oh, I don't know, 45 seconds, is that the the in conclusion, we burn the jacket. It's all over. Welcome to the Hellmouth where even outerwear isn't safe. But Mm -hmm. it's like that. That's the problem. The pro the problem is the jacket. The problem is not the jacket. (laughs) The problem is not. That Dawn literally lays down on the train tracks to kill herself. That Buffy is almost raped by this kid because she's brainwashed into having sex with him. And like, I mean, come on. But it's okay because she makes the move on him. Because she's assertive. Right. What? No, it's, the whole, it's so bad. It's so bad. It is so bad. And the whole, so the whole subtextual, like, these popular dudes are cheating at being men. And then we get to, we're also, so we're, so we're shame on these dudes for cheating with our magic jackets, but also isn't female desire funny? Mm-hmm. Which... And isn't brainwashing a woman to make her have sex with you cute? Like, this is the thing that drives me crazy. My heading for this is the episode that rape culture built, right? <laughs> okay, now for anyone who wants to hear the full rant with textual evidence and whatever about why this episode is steeped in, boys will be boys, isn't he cute rape culture? You can go back to the beginning of Still Pretty in your podcast feed or visit the Still Pretty playlist on the Chipperish Media YouTube page to get to it. But I am just fucking tired of talking about this. I am tired of pulling out cute moments from 16 Candles or Revenge of the Nerds or harrowing moments that use rape for excitement and spectacle but never follow through like in Outlander and Game of Thrones. Although in fairness, Outlander sort of followed through once when the victim was a man. Not going to talk about that here, but oh my God. So 
I know people roll their eyes at me when I start out a discussion of the fluff episode him with a rant about rape culture, but go ahead, roll your eyes, unsubscribe. I don't care. I am so tired of seeing this particular brand of isn't he a cute little scoundrel when the only consequence for the perpetrator is that he loses his favorite jacket. Right. Like that is his punishment. <laughs> Jonathan's punishment was that, Jonathan, you have to go back to being a nerd. Uh, no. When I talk about storytelling and rubber stamping, this is exactly what I'm talking about. It is OK to have shitty people doing shitty things in fiction. We need to have shitty people doing shitty things in fiction. But we actively need to not follow up said shittiness with, oh, isn't he cute? Isn't he just a little scoundrel? <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and we disagreed about this in text this morning when we were like, mm-hmm. what the fuck are we going to say about this episode? That's not just, oh, my God, a man yeah. wrote this. And then other <laughs> men behind the scenes were like, yep, sounds good. And then a man directed yeah. it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, what am I going to say? Like six, six yeah. of my 20 notes are just, wow. Wow. OK. Male writers. Yeah. Um, My this is we have like. An interesting thing to talk about here, which is my read, is that RJ doesn't know that the jacket is magic. Right. I rewatched that scene, too, because like because I think you can argue because his brother clearly doesn't know or he never would have given it up. Right. They don't figure Um, it out. They don't seem to know. At least that's my I think he does know. I think he absolutely does know because he was a quote unquote nerd who couldn't get girls or whatever and was into mock UN or whatever it was he made fun of him. The brother made fun of him for. And then he puts on this jacket and suddenly he's a football player and everybody's in love with him and everybody thinks he's great. So also it doesn't have that effect on men. Yeah. Because men see him put on the thing. So there's that whole thing, too. Oh, uh, that, that's oh, another. I can talk about the heterosexism in this episode. Anyway, go ahead. But but yes, it looks to me and maybe it's that the actor is doing the like, I am a cardboard cutout of a hot boy thing, which yes, exactly. I think is what they hired him to do. I think he does a great job. Yes. I think he does I think a he great exactly job what he was hired to do. being this mm-hmm. like cardboard cutout male model. You know, I show up, I wear the jacket, I look at this girl like that's, you know, uh-huh. I think I read him and maybe it is just that blank male model stare as like, yeah. he just doesn't really, he doesn't really get it and he doesn't really care and he doesn't know that the jacket is magic because he doesn't have to care. Well, but there's I, this moment with Buffy when yeah. Buffy's yelling at him and I went back and watched it and I think that you can make an argument for either of our positions on this because, you know, it just depends on how you read his expression. She is in the middle of, of yelling at him. She turns her back to him mm-hmm. and he starts putting on the jacket and we have this moment where we hold on his expression and I think that he fucking knows exactly what's going on there. And he knows that these women are beating each other up to get to him. Like he knows, I think he knows. He also is portrayed as like not a dumb kid, right? He was into mock UN. Yeah, he was that's into true. like all the quote unquote nerdy stuff, right? So here we have this kid who I believe, and this is part of what makes my read of this episode so like infuriating for me is that he is absolutely complicit. He absolutely knows what's going on. Um, And all he gets is his jacket taken away from him. And we don't follow up that like, hey, that shit's not okay. I mean, and the thing is, is that when you do that, you know, we have that, um, you know, brainwashing thing going on with Buffy. Buffy almost fucked a student at the high school. Like, right. that's not okay. It's like, a and classroom, you, as, you shouter head. <laughs> like, as on. Buffy, exactly. <laughs> as Buffy, like, that's got to be fucking horrifying for her well and there's this whole thing too where it's like there comes a point later in the episode where all of the women are like we know we're under a spell or i don't know like they know that there's a spell and they're like they think everybody else is under the spell it's so weird oh my god it's so weird. it is it's so weird i read that moment when buffy shifts her tone and starts flirting with him i read his expression in that shot reverse shot is confusion That Mm -hmm. he, it looks to me like at first he's like, wait, she was just reprimanding me and now she's flirting with me. And it's like, it's almost like he's catching up. But then obviously he doesn't mind so much because he doesn't mind so much because this happens to him. Right. (laughs) Right. These women just go nuts over. I mean, in conclusion, I don't know 
how much it actually matters if RJ knows mm-hmm. what the jacket does or yeah. doesn't do. He mm-hmm. understands that his position as high school quarterback entitles yeah. him to this kind of attention from women. Right. He doesn't. Qu- but it is possible for us to believe that he doesn't know because he's a high school quarterback, so he is entitled right. to all of this. So is that he comes like with the program yeah. sinister? So it doesn't it doesn't actually matter whether he knows about the apparently actual magic of the jacket. The jacket has metaphorical magic, so it doesn't yes. really it ultimately it doesn't matter. But it was funny because I read him as being this kind of doofy, like yeah, I'm just gonna wear my jacket and play football, and it's really hard <laughs> being me, and all these girls want me. I guess you know it's like. <laughs> You know, I just like read him as this like doofy guy. Yeah. Not that that makes it any better or worse, but I kind yeah, of. Yeah, it's just, it's so. It. I mean, I guess. Mm, hmm. See, that feels, that feels more misogynistic, I guess, if he doesn't know. Yeah. Because then it's, lol, bitches be crazy. <laughs> like, we're right. back to like women with their crushes on hot men i don't i don't know i don't we're in one is shitty this heterosexual suit or culture i don't understand <laughs> <laughs> what? wait talk to me about the heterosexism you oh, have yeah. something okay, to say right. about that so, yes i really 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 don't want to talk about willow in this episode like i okay. really don't want to but i also kind of feel like i have to because okay. I mean, I feel like as a lesbian, I have to talk about Willow in this in this episode. <laughs> um, I have to talk about. I mean, the yeah. bi erasure, the guy erasure, which, as you say, like the joke about I'll make him a girl, mm-hmm. is terrible, and it's so funny, <laughs> especially when Anya's like, "Damn it, <laughs> what are you gonna do? Make him a girl?" <laughs> but like, Oh my god, I don't even see I don't even want to rehash it again. This whole like mm-hmm. Willow's bisexuality is completely erased by the show because we're trying to do something progressive with representation mm-hmm. of a lesbian, but then we completely erase her very positive relationship with a man who yeah. I'm pretty sure had a penis and then there's all of the mm-hmm. bullshit about uh, 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 the person that like you're a lesbian mm-hmm. and the person that you are i was gonna say have a crush on but of course they would all argue with me right the person that yes. you are it, that you see into their soul through their ass mm-hmm. you know has a penis <laughs> and as a lesbian you can't tolerate that because you know no woman has ever yeah. had a penis it's just like come on yes. and i know i know what they're doing i know what they're doing they're mm-hmm. trying to like re-up the lesbianism for willow and i get it and it's 20 years ago and i'm just so tired i me uh, me uh, and right? hannah gadsby i identify as tired <laughs> um <laughs> but there's one moment there yeah. there i mean one moment there are many yeah. moments the whole willow is a lesbian who is also under the spell of this magic jacket mm-hmm. is so fucked up on so many levels Especially since, once again, with the love spell magic, we've completely erased queer mm-hmm. people and queer men. And it only works on the jacket only works on women, but it works on all women. And regardless I know, of I don't even understand. whether or not they might be attracted to this boy. I mean, you know, or like, Buffy would not be attracted to this boy because he's a child. And, you know, so we have that, too. <sighs> like, it overrides who they might be attracted to. Also, yes, there is huge bi erasure with, with Willow. And there's been a lot of discussion about that out in the fandom. Um, yeah. And it sucks. Like, it's uh, every direction is terrible. It's right? Like, bad I always want everywhere. to give people the benefit of the doubt. And mm-hmm. this is just terrible. But there's one moment, like, one just so egregious, uh-huh. like, the most a man wrote this moment. <laughs> Is at the fucking bronze when yeah. Willow leans over to Xander and goes right there with you. This mm-hmm. idea that lesbians are actually men that are that exactly like, exactly okay because all right here like let's deconstruct this let's do a little bit of like queer studies shall we we'll mm-hmm. deconstruct this let's. moment yes so at this table we have two possible reactions that we're presented with as like viable reactions to Dawn Mm -hmm. dancing up on this 
boy looking all sexy. And she looks adorable. Like, mm-hmm. calm down with yes. your slut shamey bullshit. She looks so cute. There is so much slut shamey bullshit oh happening there. God. And then it's all of a sudden because it's dawn, suddenly well, we're different. Well, here's like, the thing. Like, here is yeah. the joke, right? The joke mm-hmm. is the joke is Buffy's reaction is uh that's terrible and Xander's is that's hot and then she turns around and it's dawn and Buffy's reaction is wow I'm concerned and Xander's is I am ashamed and then Willow is given there are only two reactions possible yeah then Willow sides with Xander apparently Mm -hmm. in this like here is how we react to this situation she is given this objectification of women i don't i don't (laughs) like i'm so tired lonnie i'm so tired i'm so tired but it's like like that shit is so it speaks so deeply to a man wrote this in the this is a male understanding that like this is the most cishet male understanding of lesbianism i have ever seen Mm -hmm. um yes just willow's entire i'll make him a girl i'll i it proves how much i love him because i'm willing to overlook the orientation thing which is not to say that there are not people who are queer who fall in love with somebody that they didn't expect to fall in love like it happens mm-hmm. it's cool yeah and i just oh, guys like <laughs> dudes i love how they just didn't they 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 made this episode that is ostensibly mm-hmm. on some level about cis fe- female desire and mm-hmm. like didn't ask any women like did you talk right. to women before i mean and there are women on the writing staff so i presume that it got past some women but this is the thing this is why i i don't hold it necessarily against the writers because what you don't know what you don't know you know what you are trained to see i see this as an indictment of all of us as a culture rather than any specific writer although i do see and co-sign your this was very much written by a man thing because they're they are men Uh, People identifying as men in this culture are certainly trained to think a certain way, the same way that we are trained to think based on gender assigned at birth, yada, yada, all of that kind of stuff. And it gets in our operating system at a really, really young age. I have sympathy for that. I have sympathy because I I was a person who wrote a number of novels in which some of which like I haven't looked at in a while because I've learned some shit and I am very afraid of what I might have said or done or anything like and I figure nobody's reading those novels now so it's okay and I can't do any more harm right um but I don't know so like I have a lot of sympathy for writers who didn't know what they didn't know right you know um and that what this is is an indictment of all of us you know and me too as somebody who has been complicit in that kind of culture um yes like it's we I need to take a deep 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 look at myself you know and I try to do that (laughs) as often as I can um so like I'm not mad at the writers themselves and I understand how this happened um at the same time do you want to know why I hate myself Mm. in this episode whenever I watch it Mm. (laughs) because when Buffy is is holding the uh, cannon at (laughs) Principal Wood in the back and then Spike jumps on her and it makes me laugh and willow as terrible as all of the heterosexism is and i co-sign a thousand percent allison hannigan's performance oh it's so is good funny and anya's performance is funny oh, it's so and, like, funny I, and when they I do the fucking four-way split screen the four-way shot it's with the 70s heist music hilarious. in the background I just, it it's, cracks me up and I have shame. It's hilarious. I have shame for laughing at any of it. And awful. And also, mm-hmm. I feel very strongly that if we were to watch this 
alongside other things that were airing at the same time. Mm-hmm. We like this feels very much across the board of its time when there were whole series of like like a whole joke could just be there are lesbians. Yes. And, like exactly. that is the joke. Like yes. The idea mm-hmm. Like, the idea that lesbians exist was a joke. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, well, that Andrew is gay but doesn't know he's gay yeah. is a joke. That is the entire joke. And, it, oh, right? God, that's going to be the joke for so long. And it. That is going to continue to be the joke. And I, and I mean, talk about things that, like, I love and then hate myself for loving. Yeah. Like. Yes. Because it, like, hurts. It hurts my heart in a really weird way. So I guess all of that to say is, like. We're all, you know, I can be like ragey and tender about all of this stuff. I feel very complicit. And I have to say that there is this whole association with, you know, liberal lefties like us, right, that we are incredibly smug. And I'm not going to say that there are not people who are liberal lefty and smug, you know. Um, But I feel like I just need to like put it out there that I am not smug about this like I don't feel that I am better than this I feel like this is a mirror that I'm looking into and it's making me very uncomfortable with myself like with the things that I have thought were funny I always thought this was a hilarious episode back in the day and now I'm so tired just talking about it I mean it's a romp but it's an exhausting romp like it's It's an exhausting romp it really is and I mean you're the story expert No story happens. Can we just like, why? I mean, yeah. Why? You know. (laughs) Why is this episode here? This episode is here. It's a delivery system for these jokes, for these particular jokes and this particular story. This is the funny episode where Dawn has one of our, because let's not forget episode six in season six was all the way Mm -hmm. where Dawn goes out and has an affair with a vampire boy. Um, And so we're having a, and the thing is, is that this is a quote unquote sort of on the surface Dawn centric episode, except for that in this case, Dawn should be our protagonist and having seen how incredibly badass dawn is you know i wouldn't have minded as much if dawn was the one who figured her shit out put a bunch of bricks in her purse and started swinging right yeah um but instead we have dawn as um you know completely under control that she has no ability to see past anything um you know and of course nor do any of the other women because boy right you know um and like having dawn be the protagonist of this episode showing uh you know rj as actually knowing what he was doing and then having an appropriate punishment for it i might not hate this episode so much If we had some of that, but you're right. Like the story is everybody's just trying to find this jacket and the jacket is apparently the bad guy, not the dad who apparently created this jacket so that he could rape their mom and force her to have two babies or something. Yeah. Or something like, yeah, like that's how he got my mom. That is the family story. That is fucking fucked and we don't see the guy who created it in the first place has absolutely no consequence for any of that well we hear explicitly i don't know where he got it so it's just been passed down from you know well it couldn't have been passed down longer than the 50s it's a letter jacket right right? i mean there's a certain point where it had to be created full meta jacket full meta jacket it's a metaphor i don't know i don't know man i oh god like i so it's just oh Mm -hmm. i so want it to like loop around and be meaningful but the the only story and then the only season arcy thing that happens is spike gets out of the basement and puts on a fucking button down shirt which is so funny to me why is it so funny (laughs) when xander and spike roll up to lance's house and spike is wearing like this i like crisp ironed black button front why is that hilarious 
It <laughs> it is hilarious it's because so it's funny. Spike. It's Spike in his identity. I mean, Spike's identity story is in here. Like his identity is tied up in that leather jacket, and it isn't until he puts the leather jacket back on that we actually get Spike back. That's going to happen later in the season. Um, but yeah, like when he was wearing the uh, long sleeve blue tee and beneath you, yeah. which is absolutely not like anything that Spike wears. He is so defined by what he wears. You can see how he's feeling by what he's wearing. You know. Yeah. Um, um, and so I find that really interesting. I love Spike's role in this whole thing, which is the guy who like, yeah, so it's clearly the jacket. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, that's his whole like, you know, um, I I love that. I love when he just grabs the jacket off the kid yes. and just runs, you know. Oh, OK, Xander and Spike might be a little bit of a redemption for this episode, because when Xander yeah. leans in and is like, okay, do you remember the plan? And Spike is like, I think I've got it. And then they just run up to him. Xander bear hugs him. Spike grabs the jacket and then they just book it down the street. I'm like, uh, perfect. Get him. That was I your whole plan. I kind of love them. <laughs> I love them as buddy cops. I really oh do. You know, God. I think yeah. it's kind of fun. If you just ignore everything else that oh Xander is in this episode, because this is, and again, I love, I like, I just, I'm so torn on Xander because he's wonder, he's been wonderful lately. Lately, we've been able to rely on him for wonderful. And this episode, it's daddy like. And I just, I can't. <laughs> and I'm just How like, do I work with that? I'm just like, buddy, no. Like, you know. Uh-uh. Uh, Which- it's so gross. He's great with Spike. It's great when he's working with Spike, but everything else, Xander, in this episode, I could live without. Oh, God. Oh God! Yeah, it's it's not. It's just it's oh bad. My God. It's bad, and I'm so tired of talking about this episode. Like I never want to talk about this episode again. Um, Your favorite right, part so, uh, is that you never have to talk about this episode again. <laughs> that is that is kind of my favorite part. Although although in competition with that is that yeah I'm in the management program like um. <laughs> It always reminds me of that that line in Office Space where he's like, yeah, we're putting up the drywall at the McDonald's. Like, there's something about that that I just like. It's just an adorable uh, delivery. I love the actor who plays the older brother. Like, that I find kind of delightful. But yes, mostly what I love about this episode is I never have to watch it again. And I never have to talk about it again. Not unless I decide to. There you go. Well done. How about you? What's your favorite part? Oh, my favorite part? A man wrote this. A man fully wrote this and then a bunch of other men read it and said, looks good. And then they hugged in that way where you thwack each other on the back. So it's more like punching and you make sure to leave lots of room between your pelvises for the dicks because the dicks can't get too friendly. Even if your buddy, who is definitely a man, wrote this sweet episode of a television series, bruh. Like, and then you what? Like smash beer cans on your forehead. or Oh, my God. It's like so... And, and, and yes, this week in a man wrote this. Like it's just no, I can't. I can't. I love you so. It is what it says much. on the tin. It's him. It's him. The episode is called him. You did it. Congratulations, guys. Yeah. You did it. It's the jacket. It's definitely not that you're kind of insufferable asshats. It's fine. Uh, okay. <laughs> fine. It's fine. Well, on that note, if you enjoyed this conversation, <laughs> we'd like to join in. <laughs> Follow at Chiprush on Twitter. Use the hashtag still pretty. Or as a Patreon supporter at any level, you can join the Chipperish Discord group and chat live with other listeners and the hosts. Patreon supporters are getting exclusive content like Let's Watch Roulette, where Lonnie and Ian Martin from Passion of the Nerd react to a randomly chosen movie or TV show for $5 and up supporters, while $10 and up supporters get to attend show recordings live. And we've got a new stretch goal. Once we hit 500 subscribers, we'll unlock the monthly Chip Chat, where Lonnie will host a private one-hour Zoom call open to every supporter to talk about whatever, including this terrible episode. Exactly. (gasps) You might have to talk about it again. (laughs) Uh, You know what? For for Chip Chat, if somebody wants me to, I will. (laughs) We'll just, like, fully deconstruct it. It's fine. It'll be great. Yes. So if you haven't pledged your support yet, now's the time. 
Speaking of supporters, this episode of Still Pretty was brought to you by the Chipperish Media Producers who support us on Patreon at the power producer level. These people are the reason why Still Pretty is coming to you free and ad-free right now. So thank you to Abigail, Alice, Christina, Erica, Jonathan, Kevin, Kristen, Rose, Shelly, Stephania, and Stephanie. And this week's special message for our power producers. Okay, great. Ice cream. My treat. While you're waiting for the next episode of Still Pretty, here are some things you can do. Write a great review on Apple Podcasts. Tell your friends about the show. Or be a drag in a good, fun way. We will be back next time with Conversations with Dead People, the seventh episode of Season 7 with special guest host, Dr. Kelly Jones. Until then, I don't need anyone's help. Or, okay, clearly I do, but I don't want to need anyone's help, so... Stop helping.